think you better start your tractor up before you get in trouble. Probably. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Tyler Kelly, and this is... Brian Reagan, quit thinking about my chair, Tyler. Man, I'm not sure if I can now, because now you got me. It's just, I'm thinking about it now. That's why you need to cover your tract. I will. Do you remember which tract it is today? Tyler's tract is repent, and he's going to repent about wanting to hijack my chair while he's doing his tract rack. I thought about it for like two minutes. All right. All right. So, this is our fourth in our um, five-part series on the five steps of salvation. Um, and it starts off like this. It's the most difficult command in Scripture to love your neighbor as yourself, uh, to be pure in heart, to be baptized for the remission of sins, or to love your enemy. Now, these can be daunting challenges to many of us, but none is the hardest. The most difficult command is found in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, where it says, God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. American Bible scholar J.W. McGarvey said, If God were giving special miraculous gifts today, he wouldn't ask God for the gift of healing, prophecy, or tongues. Rather, he would ask for the power above everything else to cause men to repent. People don't change their minds or lives very easily. And since repentance involves both, it's challenging. Further, repentance implies that one is on the wrong path, and none of us wants to admit they're wrong. Um, repentance is, one, a change of mind, two, it's produced by godly sorrow, and three, it results in reformation of life. Since actions are prompted by thoughts and behaviors of, of decisions, um, from Proverbs 3, 20, 23, verse 7, the process of repenting begins in the heart. An unrighteous man must forsake his thoughts, Isaiah 55, verse 7. And the Bible sometimes calls this process dying to self. This change of mind must be motivated by godly sorrow. Paul wrote, I rejoice that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. Worldly sorrow results from the negative consequences of sin and may cause one to reform, but there is no salvation in it. An adulterer might break up with his mistress solely to save his marriage. An alcoholic may put down the bottle to save his liver. And a politician might clean up his language to be more electable. Ha, ha, ha. While these may be beneficial in the short term, they may not save the soul, or they will not save the soul. But when one ceases adultery, alcohol, and filthy speech in response to learning and obeying the gospel, he can be saved eternally. Repentance culminates in reformation of life. We can't turn back the clock and relive a single yesterday as much as we might want to undo certain sins. However, we have some control over our todays and tomorrows. A Bible teacher asked her class what repentance meant. One little boy said, it's being sorry for your sins. A girl quickly corrected him, saying, it's being sorry enough to quit. We can be like one four-year-old boy who hated soap and water, especially when his mom washed his face and ears. She tried to reason with him, saying, Don't you want to be clean? He thought for a second and replied, Yes, but can't you just dust me off sometimes? And true penitents don't just desire a superficial dusting, but a thorough washing. Um, this then goes into three points to consider. Um, one should repent foremost to be saved from sin. No accountable person has ever been or will ever be saved without repenting. It's an all-men-everywhere doctrine, and it is a question on God's final exam. Eternity will either be spent in heaven or hell, weighs in the balance of the decision to repent. The next one is one should repent to enjoy an abundant life now, because contrary to popular belief, sinners do not enjoy, enjoy life more than si sinners do not enjoy life more than Christians. Jesus promised an abundant life in the here and now and heaven hereafter. And then the third one was one should repent to restore purpose and usefulness in life. How did the prodigal feel about his purpose in life as he fed the pigs? Um, in Michael Faraday's laboratory, a workman accidentally dropped a valuable silver cup into a tank of acid. The workman watched this cup quickly disintegrate, but Faraday rushed to a cabinet, took out a bottle, and poured a chemical into the tank. The silver was precipitated to the bottom and recovered, and he sent the shapeless mass to a silversmith to be refashioned. Repentance does this for us. After sin has damaged God's likeness in us and disintegrated our positive influences on others, Christ's blood can recover our true value and remake us in his image. So I wanted to jump ahead to the last part because I think it's a very insightful story and one that's pretty accurate. 
Uh, one girl saw a pearl, pearl necklace that she desperately wanted. Her mother, noting that it cost almost $2, said no. Seeing how deeply the little girl desired it, though, she relented so that she could purchase the necklace with the money from the child's piggy bank. Her daughter was delighted. She didn't have enough to cover the cost, so she did extra chores and used the dollar her grandmother gave her for her birthday to purchase the necklace within a couple of weeks. She wore it everywhere. She never took it off except for the shower and the swim, because her mom told her it would get green if it got wet. One night, her dad came in to read her a bedtime story, which was their nightly ritual. When he finished and they had prayed together, he surprised her by asking, Can I have your pearl necklace? She was stunned. No, Daddy, not my necklace. But you can have my favorite white pony with a pink mane. That's okay, he replied and kissed her goodnight. A few days later, he surprised her a second time by asking her if he could have her pearls. Again, she said no, but told him that he could have the new baby doll she got for her birthday. Again, he graciously refused and kissed her goodnight. The next night, she was sitting on the edge of her bed, weeping, when he came in. What's wrong, honey? he asked. She raised her hand out to him and said, Here, Daddy, I want you to have this. He looked down to see her pearl necklace. He reached out with one hand to take it, and with the other, he reached into his pocket and took out a velvet case. He opened it and pulled out a genuine pearl necklace and presented it to her. He said, I was wanting you to give me the dollar store necklace so I could present you with a real set of pearls. God has his hand in his pocket. Are you willing to trade? Well, that's definitely an interesting story. It is. Uh, okay. Well, that is the track track on repentance. And uh, you can email us, legbutlerchurchofchrist at gmail.com, or you can contact us through our Facebook page if you would like a copy of that. We uh, hope that you're having a good day and go in the blessing of the Lord.